with that build-up, I don't want to disappoint you, of course. Um, almost anything I say will be. Um, and in fact, the title of the talk, as you know, I imagine, is called uh, Just Because I'm Talking Doesn't Mean You're Listening. And that means that the talk itself is a kind of act of faith. It's a triumph of hope over experience. You know, I, I know that some of you already will be thinking of where you're going this evening, you know, whether you need the loo, whose car is it outside, and the previous talk. You know, so that is the way the mind works. And also there's this problem of language. And I want to quote the great psycholinguist Humpty Dumpty by saying, um, you know, words are what I mean them to be. And he's right. That is what we do. We use words with the intention that we assign to them. And of course, anyone learning English uh, as a second language is completely baffled by the number of words that all mean the same thing. And American English, with its things like mad and so on, you know, are, are exactly the, you know, and then the French come along with terrible, and you don't know, terrible is a compliment other than, you know, and it's like bad was a, also a, a good for um, a lot of kids under, under 25 or 30. So you have this linguistic problem, and I want to just tell you a couple of little anecdotes which I think really make this uh, vivid for even people who's, who are distracted, I hope. Um, if you hear other people laughing, you might tune in again. Um, there's a fr friend of mine who is Lebanese and married a Pakistani, rich, very rich businessman who knew a lot of politicians, and she had to sit through a lot of dinners, very often in the, the local language or even dialect, which she didn't understand. And she kept turning to her husband um, and so expecting him to translate. And on one particular occasion, there was a ministerial dinner which he didn't translate, and she kept sort of nudging him, and he ignored her completely. And finally, when it was over, she said, well, look, you know, I'm here. If I'm here at all, I really want to understand what people are saying. Why didn't you translate? And he said, he was speaking English. And, <laughs> but because she was expecting him not to, she didn't hear and understand any of those words. And the other one is, is, I'm going to tell you a joke in Spanish. This is quite a risky thing to do in, uh, on the TED thing. But it's two Mexican workers find themselves across the border in, in El Paso. And uh, they're just waiting, trying to get some work. And one says to the other, de donde es usted? And the other one says, yo soy de Monterrey, y tú? And the other one says, oh, yo soy de Cuernavaca. Ah, the other one says, tu es mexicano. Sí, como no, y tú, ¿por qué hablamos inglés? <laughs> you laughed, it's great. Why are we speaking English? But that's the kind of problem we have. And if you think about London, just London, and I happen to be an advisor to the Metropolitan Police about race and have been for 12 years since the Lawrence Report, um, there are 320 language groups in London. Now just think about that. 320 language groups of which we, when I say we, the Metropolitan Police managed to provide a service by all the employees who speak any language at all volunteering to be available on the telephone, there are 140. So that leaves 180 language groups with nobody, at least in the Metropolitan Police, able to speak their language. And another example of that kind of thing which I know about is when Tutus and Hutus were actually, uh, Tutsi and Hutus were coming as refugees uh, from Rwanda, they would often be put in the same uh, hostel uh, just because they both came from Rwanda. And that kind of linguistic assumption and the nationalistic assumptions inform a great deal of police work, a great deal of criminal justice work, but also it informs things like the relationship between teachers and their pupils, and especially the pupils' parents. And so when you've got, um, for example, a cultural norm, as in the West Indies, where people, young men are particularly, but young people are taught that if someone, an adult, an older person was talking to you, it is respectful to avert your eyes. White liberal teachers who wanted to be sympathetic and understanding would say, look at me when I'm talking to you, and regard that as insolence um, by, the, by the person that they're addressing. And therefore, that explains at least part of the reason why there are five times more expulsions of Caribbean boys than there are of, of white kids and, and other, from other parts of the world. Because the, we have interpreted the body language as an insult that was actually meant to be respectful. And that lack of communication there is crucial in the future of that boy. And if they then call in the parents and say, your boy is acting up, 
you get a kind of denial. Absolutely, any of you who are teachers and know people who are teachers can tell you about the problem with the parents when they try and explain that Johnny isn't doing as well as he should or has caused trouble or whatever. Most parents switch into denial. Now, the problem and the really interesting part about denial is that they may even know that it's true, but they would rather believe it wasn't true than accept it and its implications. Now, that applies to a lot of situations. Doctors telling you, you know, you've got cancer, or just if you don't give up smoking and change your whole lifestyle, you will get cancer. A lot of people, again, if you're doctors or know people who are doctors, this is really tough stuff to communicate unpleasant, unwilling, unacceptable news to people who don't want to hear it. Now, the interesting thing about denial, of course, if you're having an argument, is that it's frustrating for the speaker. And unlike professionally trained doctors and so on, if you're in a normal argument, you, the other person who's just flatly denying something you know to be true means you start to raise your voice and you get more intemperate in your expression. And the more you raise your voice, the less likely they are to hear. So there's a kind of inverse law of communication there. The louder you speak, the less likely they are to hear anything but the volume. So you switch category from a verbal one into a kind of almost non-verbal. It becomes a sound rather than words. And the difficulty of people hearing that mounts literally exponentially. And what then happens is you drown yourself out so that the only thing the other person can hear is that you're shouting. And then they start saying, well, why is he shouting at me? Because they haven't heard a single word you've said explaining why you're shouting at them, and they're in denial about it anyway. So you've got this kind of circular loop of problem there. You get this, OK? Now, let's apply it to the areas which affect all of our lives. It certainly applies in family quarrels, right? You said, who said, I told you, shut up when I'm talking to you. All of the stuff that you know, is familiar and that, that sort of discussion, if you can call it that in which everybody, anyone who's been punished unfairly for something their brother did first or sister or whatever, knows that you sit, sit there sulking and thinking that this life is unfair, you're going to run away from home, all of this stuff, right? Well, that applies in the criminal justice system big time. Because the criminal justice system is based on an assumption that you can communicate to offenders the consequences of their actions. And the whole theory of the criminal justice system is that punishment will deter others from doing the same thing, and the people who've perpetrated uh, the crime from doing it again. And therefore, the higher the sentence, the more likely they are not to do it again. And it's called, and you've undoubtedly heard this from sentences and politicians, sending a message, right? You have, I, I, I want to you know, I reach for my gun when I hear <laughs> somebody sending a message. But, but I have to say that, you know, who is listening? Right? Who is sitting there reading the, le the law report saying, oh, I see, they've upped the, you know, the penalty for this or that by this much, and therefore I'm going to give it up. It's not worth a candle, right? <laughs> well, the answer is there is a small group of people who actually are doing that, and they are serious professional criminals. They look at this stuff and say, well, I'm, drugs are now so bad, if you get caught with drugs, I'm not going to do it. So they smuggle cigarettes. And if you take cigarettes, just a few years ago when I was looking at this, there was three billion pounds in Britain alone lost to the Treasury and VAT through smuggled cigarettes. Now, that's pretty good money. And they're very clever about it. And you know this is a serious business. But the young offenders, who are the stuff of most crime, and the, the general people who act on impulse because they're drunk, because they lose their temper, because somebody dissed them, right? A mis maybe a misunderstanding, but just the words. Most violence happens for that reason. Somebody has misunderstood a look, a gesture, or a word and then they get into serious trouble because of that. They don't care at that moment. They don't say, you've just bumped into me, spilled your drink on me. I'm going to wonder what the penalty would be if I bashed you. <laughs> they just don't do that. They don't even call the police if they're the victim of it, because they don't think the police will have any interest or help, be any help to this. And they're right. What's interesting about the whole system is that if they do actually bother to get someone, it's a tiny proportion, by the way. Part of the illusion is that the police can stop crime or, by doing this. In fact, detection and catching people, which is what everyone keeps saying is their job, they're pretty bad at. The detection rate is under 20% in lots of parts of the country, certainly in the Met. The conviction rate is much lower than that. And if I took you through what's called the rate of attrition, which is 100 percent of, as it were, 100 victims, 
Only 50% will report their crime at all. Only 30% of that will be recorded by the police as a crime because the others they can't be bothered with, it's too much trouble, or things like rape and sexual violence very often are not reported, and they just don't. They treat it very badly, as you may be hearing from one of the other speakers later. So you get down to, and I mean this, 3% of that 100 end up in court, 2% get convicted, and less than 1% go to prison. And the prisons are full. So now just think, if we actually doubled that rate, which would take a lot of work and very unlikely, where would they go? They would get up to 4%, fantastic, right? Out of 100. So in fact, you can't protect us by just catching people and punishing them. You just, we're not good enough at it, it's impossible. But what does work and is a form of communication is when it matters to other people what you do. And therefore, there's a system called restorative justice in which the victims meet their offenders. Not in court, very often they've gone through the court system. But at that point, instead of the debate being about who did what when, which is all court is ever about, proving this event happened and the client or the accused has done what is they're, they're accused of or not, and that adversarial debate, of course, is a dialogue of the deaf, if there ever was one, that both sides are saying the exact opposite, and the jurors are somehow supposed to make the, uh, the, the judgment about that. Instead, you have a human communication. And there's a basic difference in communication theory between adversarial arguments, as you hear in Prime Minister's Question Time, all the political debates, the American election being the most obvious one with 50% of the country thinking the other 50% are completely off their heads, which I think they are too, by the way. Um, they, you can guess which 50% I'm talking about. Um, but you have instead a human contact, which is what's utterly missing from politics and from the criminal justice system normally. You have a kind of human contact in which, as the great as, as, as psychiatrist uh, Carl Rogers developed this theory about finding common ground. And I have filmed and written a book about restorative justice in which I have seen a whole variety of people who never wanted to talk to their uh, offender because they were so offended by them. But when they were persuaded this would somehow ease the pain that they're living with and the justice system did nothing to alleviate, they've done it. They've taken the risk. And for example, I've filmed a, 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 a man whose motorbike, precious motorbike, was, had the wires pulled and vandalized by a 10-year-old. And he really was, would do serious harm to this kid, he was saying, right up to the point where they met. But he met the boy, he met with his father, and he saw the remorse he had. And what had been a total blind rage, really only a few minutes before, turned into a kind of compassion for the boy's remorse. And watching that process, was very moving, and at the end of it, he gave the boy a lift around the place where they'd met. You know, and you just felt that was a way forward for both of them, and it was a piece of communication that I couldn't have imagined in any court, where the lawyers involved would say, you know, you don't understand, my boy's had a tough life, and the other one was saying, you know, the precious motorbike meant so much to the victim, but they never talk about really what the meaning of this is in human terms. And they whisper in Latinate phrases anyway about an event that's happened months before. So the offender, who we're supposed to be encouraging to take responsibility for their actions, has forgotten what he did and why he did it. But when he sees the victim, it all comes back to them. Now, the best example of this I have is of an of a ex-drug dealer who, at the age of 19, was involved in a deal that went wrong. He shoots the drug dealer and then hears a scream from a car without looking, puts his pistol into the car and shoots the girlfriend of the person he had just killed. Kills her too. He gets life, but he has never met the girl he's killed, and for those 10 years never thought about her family. But the Texas Victim Services got in touch with her because her life was completely in pieces and proposed that she start communicating with this man, who it was 10 years later. And they wrote to each other for a year and agreed to meet. And we filmed for four hours this meeting. And I would like to say, you know, he burst into tears and so on. No, in fact, what we did have is a kind of small tear and a very whispered sorry at the end of a couple of hours of reading her poems, finding out who this girl was that he had, had killed. And she, at the, when the filming was over, said, 
Well, it's nice that he said sorry, but frankly, I don't know if it's had any impulse, any effect on him at all. But it did. And some time later, weeks later, they communicated again and began a partnership inside the Texas Prison Service about the da making, doing lectures and talks about the dangers of drugs and guns. Now, that's the kind of positive outcome you get from restorative justice. I know of no such equivalent in the conventional criminal justice system, but it shows you what the potential of communication can be when you're willing to listen and find common ground. And I just want to leave you with the thought that when you're in the middle of another quarrel with your partner, your children, your wife, mother, whatever, and who said, and you said, and you're in some other political row or somebody saying that Sheffield Wednesday isn't as good as Leeds United or, you know, you're having one of those, just pause and try and find common ground because what will come of that will enrich both of you, not just you. Thank you.